what God is doing within those community groups. So we thought, what a great idea. Let's have some people tell us directly about community groups. So take a seat, let's watch this video, and we'll be back. We had just gotten married, um, and we moved back to Casper. Nick's originally from here. I was moving here for the first time and wanted to get to know people, more people our age. And we decided to come to Highland one Sunday morning. And afterwards, we were looking in the community place area at pamphlets. And um, Emily Redkin came up to us and we just started chatting and come to find out Reed and Nick went to school. They grew up together. And that's kind of how it started. Hi, my name is Nick Whips. And I'm Courtney Whips. And we've been attending Highland for nine years now. Hi, I'm Sheila McConaughey. Well, I was touched by community groups before I ever even moved here. Um, 
My husband was ill. We decided to move to Casper, bought a home. I had the moving truck come, and then we found out he needed a second surgery. So my daughter said, don't cancel the truck, I'll meet the truck. Her community group heard about that, and with my daughter, the community group, and other friends and family, they not only met the truck, but they unpacked every box, they hung every picture, they made every bed. And when Flip and I got here, we walked into a home that was cozy and comfortable, not a house that was cold and filled with unpacked boxes. Less than a month later, my husband died, and once again, the community group was there for us. They supported us, and I knew that I wanted these women in my life. Not for what they had done, but the love with which they had done it. So I began going to that group, and then I've hosted it in my cozy house for the past three years. For me, being in a community group has been a way for, to keep centered. We're all individuals that are on this path trying to pursue Jesus and be the best Christians that we can possibly be. And uh, just having a bunch of people that are in my corner cheering for me, it, it's been awesome. The safe feeling that I get when I'm with that group, my lack of knowledge isn't a threat. I never feel judged. I can share, I can expand, I can hear other people's interpretation and it's just a feeling of security when I'm with them to learn more about God. Um, so over the past couple years, we've done Love Your City, Kids Against Hunger, uh, Night to Shine, also Operation Christmas Child. We all try to come together and at least do a couple events a year. Um, obviously with family now, it's a little bit harder to juggle everybody, but we do try to give back and do it as a team. I think if Courtney wouldn't have reached out at the place that one Sunday, I don't know where I'd be in my faith walk. And I am just so thankful and grateful that uh, God has put a wonderful group of people into our lives because it, it's just been something that I'm very grateful for. Definitely. We feel very blessed to have this group as part of our lives. See the panic in your eyes, and I know you can see it in mine. We've been through some crazy things before, but nothing like this. You know I've always got a lot to say, but this has left me nothing but afraid. And I've got one thing I'm holding on to, and it's your hand. Cause I believe together we'll get through this. Together. There's no valley too deep, no river too wide, no mountain too steep that we can't climb together. We got all we need together. Just what you see, we're gonna make it come one day. Nothing can break us if we stay together. I know it's hard to fight the enemy when the sky is too dark. Start to believe we're fighting with each other. But if we really look deep enough, I believe we can find the love. And when this storm has finally passed, we'll see that all we have is what we have. Together, we get through this. Together, no matter what it is, there's no valley too deep, no river too wide, no mountain too steep that we can.
months. I can't even begin to count the amount of times I've said, we're gonna make it. We're almost there. We're, we can do this. Sometimes it was to myself, but a lot of the time it was to my husband or to my tribe or community or my village or whatever you wanna call it because I know I cannot do it by myself. And God knows that we can't do it by ourselves. That's why he gave Adam Eve because we're not meant to walk through the yuck alone. Today we're celebrating what God's doing in community groups. And a part of that is getting connected. So if you're sitting there going, gosh, I think I'm doing this by myself. We have a whole group of people who wanna make sure that that's not the case anymore. So I just wanna invite you to go see them at the place after service and say, I'm ready to get connected. I'm ready to not be walking by myself because I'm tired and I can't do it anymore. It's a great place to be. My name is Morgan, good morning. I'm so glad that you all are here today in this building and online, we just wanna welcome you. There's so much happening right now and really a lot happening here in the next couple of weeks as fall kickoff is right around the corner that we cannot wait to tell you about. So let's watch these announcements, wait for it, together. Good morning, Highland. My name is Greg and I'm the Congregational Care Pastor here and I'm so excited to welcome you to worship today. You know, if you're a guest this morning, we're especially glad that you're here and we wanna extend an extra welcome to you as well. You know, we'd really like to get to know you. So let's take a minute and talk about your next steps here at Highland. So one great way to do that is through community groups. If you're new here or if you're not in a community group right now, now's the perfect time for you to get plugged in. For our church online, we wanna get connected with you as well. So please text the number below and someone from our team will get back to you. Another great way to get connected is by serving and volunteering. God has equipped each of us with specific gifts, which means there are so many gifted people right here in this room. So let's take that next step together and find a way to serve and impact the lives of children and students and adults, both inside and outside of this building. Visit the link below. For other ways to serve, visit Go Central after the service, or you can text the word serve in the number below. You know, we wanna know what's happening in your life and how we can pray for you. Each Tuesday, our entire staff gathers together to pray over every request. So you can visit our website at the link below to fill out what we call a prayer and connection card, or you can visit the information desk after the service for a physical card. At Highland, we take risks to pursue God and to love like Jesus. And because of this, we are fully united in making sure that everyone in our surrounded area knows that Jesus loves them. And when each of us does our part to share about Jesus with others, we'll make a way to have 50,000 Jesus conversations this year. Each time that you have a conversation, use a 2021 sticker to add your conversation to the wall in the atrium. We'd also encourage you to visit our website to submit your Jesus conversations for a book that Highland is writing to encourage others to care and to share and to pray for others each and every day. You know, fall kickoff is right around the corner. And with that, we'll be making a change to our service times. Prior to COVID, we had two one hour long services, one at nine o'clock a.m. and the other at 10.45 a.m. So beginning September 12th, it's the second Sunday in September, we'll be moving back to these times with children's and youth programming being available at the nine o'clock time only. We also wanna let you know that next Sunday on September 5 is Labor Day weekend. So we'll be having one service, both in person and online at 9.15 a.m. You know, as we worship, I wanna encourage you to offer God your tithes and your offerings. You can give on our app or on our website. And you may also drop your tithes in one of the baskets as you exit the sanctuary today. Your obedience and faithfulness and giving continues to make a huge impact, not only in our community here, but also in larger Wyoming as well. For example, our Cody campus is moving toward a launch, ready to take that community for Jesus. Yet now, each week, about 30 adults and 15 children are gathering in Cody to watch and worship with us online. In fact, they're joining us today. Welcome, Cody, glad you're here. As we begin today's message, let's take a look at one person's story of chaos, hurt, and how a community came together 
to rescue. a story to tell, and this is mine. That was my story. The Friday night before my accident, my brother, my sister-in-law, my dad, and his wife, Diane, uh, Lane and Tom and I snowmobiled into uh, Lane and Laura's cabin. It was a cold night, but it felt so good to be outside and in the snowy mountains. We grew up skiing and snowmobiling, and a couple of years ago, I took up snowshoeing. So I really do love the mountain, and I love even the snow. That Friday night, we shared some appetizers, and we warmed up soup, and we laughed and told some of the same old stories that we tell every time we get together. It was a quiet night at the cabin, I felt such a deep sense of uh, contentment as we got in bed that night. I flipped open a book, I read for a while, and then I fell into a deep sleep. Sunday morning was, or Saturday morning was absolutely gorgeous. The snow was lightly falling. We ate breakfast together discussing the, the different landscape, how it's ever changing since that huge fire had rolled through uh, several years ago. About 9.30, we set out on the snowmobiles to take our stepmom, Diane, out to her car because she had a lunch party she needed to attend. And we decided to go for a ride through Teepee Canyon on our way back to the cabin to clean up and pack up. I had left my snowmobiling pants in the truck the night before, so Laura mentioned that I should probably put those on before um, we took off into the canyon. We stopped and said goodbye, and I almost got back on that machine again. It's the strangest thing. I felt a breeze across my face, and I sensed that I needed to put those snow pants on. It was 12 degrees, and I would really need those insulated pants. When Lane, Laura, Dad, and Tom and I left the parking lot that time out of the canyon, I remember thinking, or out of the parking lot, I remember thinking that the machine I was riding was <laughs> way too powerful for me. In fact, it jumped when I accelerated and I yelled like, whoa, into the helmet. After about 25 minutes or so, we began descending into the canyon. This little skinny trail was mostly a series of, you know, gradual turns. Back and forth, back and forth, we wound our way down. It was quiet, and the landscape unmarred as this new snow was falling. It was pristine, peaceful. My right thumb complained about the grip range it took for me to hit the throttle. It was a falling asleep, so I did what I've done a hundred times before. I took my hand off, and I shook it out for a second, and then I reach back to take hold of the machine. It's a little blurry here. 
What happened though is I grabbed that throttle as I grabbed the machine. And that 800 horsepower machine shot forward as I had commanded. And I was thrown off and off into the rocky canyon floor. Lying face down, my helmet shield was broken and there was snow packed in around my helmet. I had snow um, back packed behind my glasses. But I could see just enough that I could see the tail lights of my crew pulling away, at least three of them. I, uh, I immediately began wiggling my fingers and toes. I had hit pretty hard my head. And so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm good. I'm not paralyzed, I can do that. But I knew that I could not move my right leg. And it was, um, you know, it was flung awkwardly over, to, over on top of this big boulder that was sitting out. Within a minute or two, Tom, who had taken a potty break, he'll probably kill me that I told that, but anyway, um, he came, so that's why he wasn't with me, he wasn't behind me, but he came roaring up behind and um, we determined with a little bit of conversation and, and I, remembered, I remember telling him, go ahead, try and move my leg a little bit. Oh no, that was not happening. Um, and later we would find out that my pelvis was broken in four places. So there was a lot of pain. And he knew he needed to go get the rest of our crew, so he took off his coat, covered me, and sped away to find them. Tom was gone a few minutes. I, of course, have no idea, maybe 10, I don't know. But when everyone arrived back at the accident site, they shifted into high gear. Tom and Lane covered me with space, space blankets and with their coats, and they began a fire. Laura and dad went back to the cabin that was about four miles away to grab this little four foot plastic sled and some pillows and some blankets. They were planning on how to move me out of there. They knew that an emergency vehicle could not come down to where we were, so they would have to do it. The guys planned to put that short sled on my back and they were gonna flip me over, try to make me comfortable, and to pull me out on that machine. Hmm. I was thinking, do people really pass out with pain? I was sure hoping so. Mm. Though they didn't say it out loud, Lane and Laura, who are both uh, doctors, knew that with this kind of injury, there would be a good chance I was bleeding internally. And it was imperative that they get me to a hospital as quickly as possible. While Laura was back at the cabin, she was able to get enough cell service to call 911 so that the ambulance would be waiting for us at the end of the snowplowed road. And she was able to call our children. And then our kids began texting our groups and the group members Tom and I are in a community group together, so we do that every week together, and he's in a men's group and I'm in a women's group. So between us, we have lots of people. And they began praying for us. So as I laid on the ground praying that I could survive being moved, groups of people were praying too, really with only within about 25 minutes of the accident. What all happened in the ensuing hours, I'm only clear if somebody reminds me what happened and told me. I do know that while Tom and Lane were trying to get, keep me comfortable, my dad was bringing back the sled, and Laura was meeting the ambulance and the Casper Mountain Ski Patrol and the sheriff at the parking lot. She was told that the Hagland, which is a tracked medical vehicle, which had never ever been used before, and it was stored in mills, actually, that it was also on its way up the mountain, but still, it was too big to get back to where we were. 
So sometime in that, you know, all these conversations going on, the sheriff, trying to figure out how to get to me, called his dad, who had also spent the night at their cabin that evening, and he said, are you still around? His dad said, yes, in fact, we were just loading up to leave. But instead of loading up, they were coming for me. He unloaded his Can-Am, which is a tracked side-by-side vehicle or trailer, yeah, vehicle, and smaller than the Haglin, so it could actually make its way down the cabin to where we were. Laura and the other people who started to notice all the commotion loaded up the first responders, the ski patrol, uh, the machines to come get me. Before, uh, Before everyone set out, Laura sent a man, Jason Fox, who he comes to church here, who races snowmobiles and who just happened to be at his mountain home that morning, which is really close to the parking lot where they were meeting. So she said, you go, go as fast as you can, and I'll bring the, fe- the rest of the first responders. Go and tell them that we're coming. We had no idea what was happening at the end of the road, the parking lot. We had, we had no idea anyone was coming to help. So in the meantime, my dad brought back the small sled, blankets, etc., and the guys worked around me fitting that sled on my back. They were ready to flip me over. Hmm. They were ready to flip me over when we heard the whine of a snowmobile in the distance. They paused as it drew closer and Jason Fox, the snowmobile racer, flew into the accident site. He jumped off and he told the guys, they're coming. And Lane, still not sure what was happening, said, who's coming? Jason told us that there were a bunch of folks coming to the rescue. I could not see what was going on. I was still on my stomach, but I heard the obvious relief in Lane's voice. The guys were dreading moving me as much as I was dreading it. And by this point, I was still, uh, I was starting to get very, very cold and Jason really mostly a stranger to me, and Tom slipped off my boots and started rubbing my feet to warm them up. And then I heard them coming, the team of rescuers. Probably eight or nine, there were probably five or six machines. They talked with me, they gave me morphine for the move, they strapped me in tight until I felt safe and then began pulling me out behind the sheriff's dad, who wasn't even supposed to be there, his tracked vehicle. Now these were going to be the minutes and miles that were the longest of my experience. Because now, I was by myself, looking out of a little tiny peephole, strapped into a sled. Tom, Dad, Lane, and Laura got on their snow machines and we continued the journey that we had begun hours before. As we went up and down a little bit and around the corners, leaving the canyon, I remember saying out loud, thank you, God. I know you rescued me. I know you see me. I have not gone unnoticed by you. I am not alone. I didn't beg God to see me because I knew that he had been there with me right from the beginning. He was with me, but I did replay over and over in my mind a story that we had been studying the week before in community group. It's about a a, a woman who had been sick for 12 years. She had been to doctors through that time and each one promising results, but only producing bills that she could no longer pay. 
By the time she crossed paths with Jesus, she was destitute, broken, and desperate. In her desperation, she sought out this miracle worker, and so did many others. So there was a crowd that day crushing in on Jesus. The woman, who wasn't even supposed to be there because she wasn't supposed to be around people at all, found herself close, close enough to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. Immediately, she was healed. And though I'm pretty sure that Jesus knew, he asked anyway, who touched me? You can hear his friends and the disciples just saying, what, what are you talking about? We, how could we possibly know? Look at this crowd, everyone's touching you. But Jesus responded, I know someone touched me. And this is the passage that I kept playing over, this one line. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling to his feet. In a heartbeat, I knew that Jesus was with me. If he could be with the woman who had struggled so, he was with me. This is the Jesus that I talked to, was confident. I was confident in him as, a, as the rescue teams began moving me. I was one woman being pulled out of a remote canyon in a state that most people can't even find on a map. And yet, I could not go unnoticed by God. This is the good news that Jesus lived out every single day. It's the good news that you cannot go unnoticed by the good and gracious God. And that was the Jesus I was clinging to that day. I'm so grateful that we had studied that passage that week. It gave me such peace as we traveled to the next stop. A couple miles down the road, they moved me into that medical vehicle, and they started warming me up there, packed me in heat, and then finally, maybe 30 minutes later, again, I'm not positive, but um, moved me then into the ambulance that was waiting at the end of the road. It was in that parking lot, as they were lifting me into the ambulance, that I teared up for the first time because I got to see the faces of my kids who were waiting for me. And actually, besides my daughter who kind of nursed me at the hospital, I wouldn't get to see any of them again for six days because of hospital regulations. All in all, from the time of the accident to the point of arriving at the hospital, it took over four hours I thank God almost every single day for that community of people, for the paramedics, for the sheriff, for the um, random people that were snowmobiling that day and they offered to help my kids who met me on the mountain, for my dad, my husband, Lane and Laura. Is it too much to say that I'm exaggerating, but I would have died out there by myself. These people acted quickly and with selfless conviction and passion, and each played a role in rescuing me. And so did many of you. Your prayers mattered. This church family matters. During my hospital stay, I, I received hundreds of texts, thankfully, because of course I didn't get to see anybody, but one person a day, oh, without, with the exception of one gal who was already a part of my community group, and she worked at the church, or at the hospital, and so she, I think, I don't wanna get her in trouble, so I won't say who it was, but I think she snuck in 
every morning, all totally, you know, garbed up and on, but, but she came in to see me every morning while I was in the hospital, and she brought me a little Dr. Pepper, which was really good. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I've told her how much I appreciated it, but I don't know if she knew, but she was part of my rescue team. Throughout the following months, those in our community groups continued to rescue me. They made us meals, they sat with me, they talked with me, and they wrote me notes. They brought gifts and encouraged me. One morning, about three and a half weeks in, after my accident, I made the decision I needed to go off these painkillers. It was a long, long day. And that night, at the end of that day, that evening, when I really needed it, um, my girls group stopped by. It was 15 below zero, and they couldn't come in because, believe it or not, while I was in the hospital, I also got COVID. And so they couldn't come in to see me, so they stood outside my window yelling messages of love to me, and they sang this little song, and it's just a little clip, but I wanted to share it. Okay, they shouldn't sing on the worship team, but that was super good for me. Um, our people, our community groups showed up over and over throughout this time. You know what they were doing? They were living the gospel. They were living the good news of Jesus. They lived out what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. They were fulfilling the law of love that we think we find throughout the New Testament. You know, there's 50 um, statements, but actually a few more than that, that's, that are called the one another's of scripture. And it's thing, and that these scriptures read something like this, love one another, be devoted to one another, be kind and compassionate to one another, serve one another, comfort one another, encourage one another, pray for one another. Our family, our peeps in community, didn't do this because I'm such a nice person or that because I'm a pastor here. They did it because Jesus lives in them and because we're friends in Jesus. We are a community. My whole accident experience reminds me of the familiar passage of scripture that reads, two are better than one. If either of them falls down, then one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Two, indeed, are better than one. If either of them falls down or has a snowmobile crash or goes through a divorce or has a child who is struggling or gets sick or loses a job, then one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls, has a crash spiritually or physically or relationally or emotionally and has no one to help them up. What if I'd been alone that day? Or if I'd been alone during some of the other tough days of my life. I suppose you, this will never be your story. I doubt you'll ever have a snowmobiling accident, but you will, without a doubt, have some kind of tough situations. It's just how life is, and you will need a rescue team, like me. You will need people to save you. Sometime you will. Pity is the person who doesn't have people, who doesn't have a cord of three or four or 12 because it cannot quickly be broken. I'm so fortunate that I have 
my three kids and their families in town. I have my dad and Diane, I have Tom and Lane and Laura. But I need my group peeps too. As Christ followers, we need to go together. We need each other. We were never meant to travel this journey alone, never. Jesus modeled community when he chose 12 imperfect guys to be his clan, to be his uh, disciples, his friends. Even he, the son of God, did not go alone. Here at Highland, we believe in community groups because they are a place designed for belonging. A place that is safe for you, where people don't judge you, but will walk with you. These people who gather weekly, and when they're committed to each other, they become best friends. I know my best friends are there. May I encourage you to take a leap of faith and jump into a community group. We are just about ready in two weeks to start our new series in Daniel. Ah, it'll be so good. Daniel was a young man living in a culture very similar to the one that we're living in right now. So I hope you'll join us. It will change your life. It may even save your life. You know, I was never alone on that cold Saturday in January. God never, not for a second, took his eyes off of me. And like he always seems to do, he rescued me by means of a family, a few strangers, and a whole lot of praying friends. And then, as I recuperated, I was rescued again and again by those people that I do life with in community. I am deeply, deeply grateful. We all have a story, and this one is mine. Let's pray together. Lord God, how we love you, how we trust you even in the hard seasons of our life. Thank you, Lord, for coming, for coming to our rescue in so many ways, for loving us, moving things around us so that we could be whole and healthy again. I love you, Jesus. Thank you in your precious name, amen. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? Well, let that lonely feeling wash away. Maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay Cause when you don't feel strong enough to stand You can reach, reach out your hand And oh, someone will come running And I know crashing through when you need a friend to carry you when you're broken on the ground you will be found so let the sun come streaming in cause you'll reach up and you'll rise again lift your head and look around you will be found
know, today we've talked a lot about community and what it looks like to be in community with one another. I really want to encourage you, if you're not, go out the center doors, take a left. Visit Tammy and her team at the place. They would love to get to know you and to get you connected. I'm in a community group, too, actually. And I love it because they are my people. But if you look behind me, this is also my community. And I found them through choosing to serve. So after you get connected with a community group, I really want to encourage you to go next door to the uh, Go Central. And let's get you connected there as well. There's so much going on in this body of believers. But we can't do it by ourselves. We need you. And you need one another. So go out. Find your people. Find your community. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Remember, next week is Labor Day. So there's only the one service at 915. So we hope to see you there. Have a wonderful week, guys.